Hey, dads, how many of you guys can relate that your family just doesn't get your jokes? They just don't know good taste, do they? They just don't get it. So, hey, happy Father's Day. We're so grateful, so glad that you guys are here. Um, it's always good to laugh. Uh, last week, um, there were a lot of people laughing at me last week, and I, I just got to come clean on this. I found out halfway through the week that I meant to say something about the Garden of the Gods, and I said the Garden of Eden. And I was talking about how my wife and I went to the Garden of Eden and talked to a park ranger there, and everybody just kept laughing at me, and I just didn't get it. I just didn't get it. So listen, at least people were laughing at me last week, so my dad jokes don't get that kind of a response. Hey guys, I want to say this. Men, I believe you are the greatest catalyst for the kingdom of heaven on this earth. Men, I believe you're the greatest catalyst for the kingdom on this earth, and uh, God believes in you, this church believes in you, and our prayer is that you have a fantastic day today. Happy Father's Day to you all. Um, we are in the very beginning weeks of this book study. It's the book of John, one of the first four chapters in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are what we call the Gospels. They capture the story of Jesus, and even though we're going to be spending a good chunk of time on this, uh, this book, we're spending the entire summer on it, um, there is no way that we're going to be able to cover everything in this series, as you'll find out today. I'm, I'm tackling a big chunk of it, and I, I wish that I could preach three sermons on this, uh, but I'm going to try and get it into one sermon that's roughly two hours long, so if you guys are ready. Um, hey, seriously, um, I, I'm, I'm going to try and not keep it to two hours, but I want to encourage you to read this book for yourself this summer. Okay, don't just rely on a pastor who stands on a platform to get your word of God, okay? Dive into this. This is going to be a great opportunity for you to read it at home, study it in your groups. Um, let's, let's tackle this together. Um, in this series, we're focusing on the seven miracles, the seven metaphors, and the seven conversations that Jesus had in this book that John captures. And it's important for us to see that who Jesus is is backed up by what he does and what he says. Who Jesus is. It's backed up by what he does and what he says. In other words, the signs and all the conversations that we talk about during the sermon here, they, they interplay with his role, with his identity. And that's John's goal. He wants to paint a clear picture for you of the identity of Jesus. So chapter four starts out with John making some comments about baptism. I just want to, um, I actually, we're not going to talk about it a whole lot, but I want to hijack it and just say, you guys, if you've never been baptized, in a couple of weeks when we do our baptism party, it's your time. It's your time. John talks about baptism because there was an issue that was going on where people were um, almost comparing um, who baptized them. Like, um, it was, it was you, you were better because John baptized you, or well, Jesus baptized me. And, and John was saying, um, it's not about who baptizes you. It's about the decision you are making as you're getting baptized, the decision you are making of saying, I am following Jesus in this life. This is my commitment. He said, that's what it's about. It's not about who does the baptizing. So I want to encourage you. There's going to be a great opportunity. If you have never been baptized before, um, just let us know. You could text TNG baptism and we will get in touch with you. I want to have an opportunity for everybody to celebrate with us. Uh, let's, let's take a moment here and let's pray as we begin. Father, we thank you again for uh, the opportunity to be able to dive into your word, to learn more about you. And Lord, we just pray um, that as we do that today, that your word comes alive inside of us, inside of our hearts today, that you'd speak straight to us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Have you ever wanted to hide? Have you ever wanted to uh, just go to a place where people couldn't see you? Maybe it was just keeping your head down, staying away from the crowds, not making eye contact. There's a lot of reasons why people, um, they don't want to interact. Sometimes it's a, it's a lack of confidence. Sometimes it's because they're hiding something. Sometimes it's just because they're tired, they're, they're weary. Have you ever been in a class and you can tell that the teacher is looking for someone to call on and you don't want it to be you? Have you ever just uh, wanted to slip in and out of the supermarket without being noticed? Maybe it's because you're still wearing your PJs that you call sweats, right? <laughs> Have you ever uh, tried to sneak into work and hustle to your office before anybody notices and strikes up a conversation with you? There's a lot of reasons why people want to be unnoticed at times. And that's certainly the case with the, the woman that we're talking about today. She had a past that wasn't very pretty. 
she had been used up and kicked out. People, people were not at the top of her list anymore. And John captures this conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. And I want us to take a moment and look at it together. together. We're going we're gonna to tackle some big chunks of Scripture today. And I just want to read through this together as we do. So he starts out in verse 4. He said, Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, John starts out this conversation with Jesus had to go. Jesus had to go. This conversation with the Samaritan woman starts out this. Now, it was the quickest route. It was the normal path that they would take. But there's something that John is communicating here that points out that Jesus actually felt compelled in his heart. He had to go. He must go. This was important. This was important for him. And we're about to see what was so important about it. Now, here's what you need to know about this woman. Life has not been good to her. She's failed at marriage. And she's in a culture that has very little grace for women. So five times she started over in marriage. Five times she was rejected. But she wasn't just rejected by these men that were her husbands. It appears that she actually has no friends at all. There's no one that she's doing life with, with right now. And so when we pick up this story in chapter 4, she comes to the well in the middle of the day. And that's really significant for us because it's, uh, it's the time when typically no one would have been around. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever gone to a place during off hours to avoid the crowds? That's what this woman was doing. See, everyone went to the well in the cool of the morning or later in the evening. They went to draw the water, but they also went for conversation. They went to talk. But this woman goes in the heat of the day, and she's looking to avoid people. She's wanting to be unnoticed. But Jesus sees in the heart of this woman that she is the one who is thirsty. She's thirsty for love. She's thirsty for acceptance. She's thirsty for purpose. And so Jesus starts the conversation out by asking her, would you get me a drink? Now, understanding the last thing this woman wants is a conversation, I mean, think about it. She came to the well in the middle of the day when no one else is around for a reason, and that reason is to avoid people. In fact, we were able to actually find a picture of that Samaritan woman, and here's, what, here's exactly what she was wearing that day. I'm, I'm done peopling today. It's, it's kind of like if you were to go to a coffee shop in the middle of the afternoon when no one's typically there, and you find a table in the back, and you just want to be by yourself, And you're just hoping nobody comes in. But in fact, somebody does come in and they come and they sit right beside you and you find out it's a talkative pastor. That's what happened is that Jesus Jesus shows up and he's ready to talk. Jesus shows up, he's ready to talk. And so the woman goes right away into killing the conversation as quickly as possible. So she asked, how is it that you being a Jew ask for a drink from me? I'm a Samaritan woman. There was this racial tension between Jews and Samaritans that she was drawing on here. And it was also a culture where men and women didn't actually talk publicly. And so for a Jewish man to talk to a a, a Samaritan woman would have just been uh, off limits. So basically, here's what she's saying. We shouldn't be talking. We shouldn't be talking. But Jesus ignored her comment, and he cut straight to the chase. Remember, he had to go through Samaria. He was compelled. So he cut straight to the chase, and Jesus asked her this. He said, if you knew the gift, or he answered her, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would be asking him, and he would have given you living water. 
So Jesus draws this woman's attention to two important matters. His identity, who he is, and the gift of God that he is able to offer her. And these two things shape their conversation. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. This woman doesn't understand either of these things. And her response shows it. Check this out. She said, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She, she reminded him how deep the well was, pointed out he didn't have anything to draw the water with, and how are you going to give me this living water? But Jesus, he chose to not respond to the woman's question. This, this dialogue that Jesus has with this woman is fascinating, and it's almost uh, humorous. I mean, have you ever asked God a question, and he didn't answer your question because he moved past the question to the real root of it, and that's, that's what Jesus is doing here. So he actually doesn't even address her question here or answer it. He goes right back to the central issue in his mind. Here's what he said. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water from Jacob's well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him, living water, will never thirst Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water, a continuous flow of water that wells up to eternal life. This living water that Jesus is talking about is the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's going to talk about this later, chapters 14, 15, and 16 in, in the book of John. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that comes to live inside of you when you say yes to Jesus. When we give ourselves to God, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, and it's something that we experience continually. There's this continuous flow of the Holy Spirit in our life. It builds up, it builds up, it builds up like a spring of water that's welling up inside of them. Now, for Jesus, this was his calling, like this was his purpose, to lead people to this understanding of the gift of God, to lead people to experience eternal life. But this woman couldn't see what he was talking about. She, she couldn't see it. Just like last week, our conversation, or when, when Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus was so focused on the physical, he couldn't see the spiritual. She's so focused on the physical here, she can't get past it. And, and so here's what she says, sir... Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw the water. This response shows us a couple of things here. First, it shows us that she's now interested in Jesus' offer. But secondly, it shows us that she still doesn't understand what it is he's offering. Okay, so, so let me ask this. Have you ever said yes to something that you didn't fully understand? Marriage? I don't know. That'd be a, let me skip over. Right. It, it would be more like this. It would be like going to a restaurant and ordering something when you didn't really know what was inside of it, and you're just like, "Yeah, I'll try that." J Jesus is is like, "I hear you, but we're still not on the same page here." So so she's interested, but she still doesn't really understand what he's talking about because Jesus is talking about water, not water. He's talking about spiritual water, not physical water. Again, just like last week, he's talking with Nicodemus about um, being born again, not born again. He's talking about a spiritual birth, not a physical birth. And it was in that conversation with Nicodemus that, that Jesus said, if you're not born again, you can't see what I'm pointing to. You're not going to understand what I'm speaking of here. That's why I tell you, you must be born of the Spirit so that you can see and you can comprehend things of the Spirit. Now, it's really important as, as we move in through the story here, it's important to understand at this point that everything that Jesus is saying to this woman is leading her to understand the gift of God. Because at first, this next part could seem a little bit rude, but he's, he's driving to something. He says, go call your husband and come back. And of course, this woman doesn't have a husband. That could almost seem a little bit mean, but here's what Jesus is up to. She says, I have no husband. And then Jesus responds with something that she wasn't expecting. He says, that's right. You've actually had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. 
Now let me tell you what's striking about this is not the number of men that this woman has had. What, what is important about this is that Jesus had so much knowledge about her personal life. And the reason why this was so significant here was the Samaritans believed the Messiah would come and Messiah would connect them to God. That was so important. The way that they would know that it was the Messiah is he will know. He will know and he won't be wrong. He will know things. He will know all things. And here Jesus is and he knows. (laughs) He knows about the five husbands. He knows about the guy she's living with right now. He knows about the things that she's kept hidden. He knows. And here's here's the beauty of this awkward and uncomfortable and unwanted conversation. Here's the beauty of it. This woman is beginning to see the identity of Jesus. She's beginning to see the identity of Jesus. And she says two things here. Here's what she says. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. In other words, he read her mail, and and she says, I see that you're a prophet. So she realizes that Jesus is not an ordinary person. Only a prophet that was sent from God would have all of that supernatural knowledge. And maybe the woman is starting to wonder, could this man, could Jesus be the Messiah. But then she pulls a move that we all have made when things start to get deep, when they start to get too personal. Here's what she says. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, you know what this is called? This is called changing the topic. This is, called, this is called shifting gears. It gets the conversation off of her. It gets the conversation off of her uncomfortable reality. And she actually goes straight to a religious hot topic of the day because the Jews and the Gentiles couldn't agree on where to worship. And so she's, she's turning to dogma. She's turning to doctrine. She's getting the topic off of her. And she implies a question in this, like, what do you think about this ancient disagreement about where we're supposed to worship? And I love Jesus' answer. Here's what he said. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. See, the, the question of the correct place to worship would soon be irrelevant, in other words. It's really, it's, it's a non-issue. Worship is no longer going to be about a place. And he goes on to say this. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. And then he says this. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus is saying what matters is not where you worship What matters is where your heart is when you worship. Your heart should be connecting with the heart of God. Your spirit should be connecting with the spirit of God. Jesus is just digging deep into this woman's heart right now. And in response, the woman says this. She said, I know that Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And you can see her saying this as she looks into Jesus' eyes. And this woman who has spent years keeping people at arm's length is letting her arm down, and she's leaning into Jesus thinking, could you be the Messiah? Here's what Jesus said. I who speak to you am he. This was the moment that Jesus longed for. It was why he had to go through Samaria. And there's so much in this conversation that Jesus is having here, but I just want to summarize with this. Jesus' grace in this woman illustrates how past prejudices, practices, and exposures don't have to ruin the potential of a person. So not only does he redeem this woman, but then you actually read that he goes on to use her in a powerful way to reach others. She places her faith in Jesus, and so do many of the Samaritans that lived in that city because Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, what's interesting is this is the only time that Jesus actually said 
that he's the Messiah until he's standing before Pilate at a, at a trial. This is the only time that he comes forward, and, he, and he, he does so with a Samaritan woman. And we're going we're gonna to pause here. Jesus shows us that he's the all-knowing God who sees through our questions to our hurts and our needs. He sees through our questions to the root. And so let, let me turn it into a question for you. Will you allow Jesus to address the real needs in your life? Or will you keep trying to change the conversation? This is where it hits home. Jesus sees through the questions. He sees, sees through the, 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 the frustrations. He sees through the comments. He sees through it all. And he sees what's in your life. He had to go through Samaria to get to this woman. And Jesus feels the very same way about you. There's a topic, there's something that he wants to address. Will you allow him to address it? Now, I'm going to shift gears here, and I'm going to touch on a couple of miracles, um, or signs as John called them, before we wrap it up together today. But just because I, I hit on these quickly doesn't mean that they are um, small and significant. So John writes next about Jesus healing uh, an official son. And maybe this guy had been in Jerusalem. Maybe he had seen some of the miracles that Jesus performed. Maybe he had, um, maybe he had heard um, of some of those. In any case, the, the, the issue was that his son was close to death. And so this man made this journey from Capernaum to Galilee to ask Jesus to come heal his son. And here's what John writes. He said, there was a certain official whose son was sick in Capernaum. And when the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. And here's what Jesus said. Here's what he said. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how Jesus um, spoke pretty harshly to people who were just looking for signs because they were missing what the sign was pointing to. They just wanted the signs. And so he, he comes out. And he says, um, you're, you're looking for signs. Unless you see signs, you'll never believe. So here's the deal. Um, sometimes Jesus realizes that in your life you need faith builders. You need a little something to, to build the faith. You need a little something. God, give me something. Give me a sign. Give me something just to build my faith. And this is why John writes this whole book, to, to grab these stories, to grab these signs, to build our faith, to see Jesus for who he really is. And so the official said, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replied with this. He said, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and he departed. In other words, he believed without actually seeing the sign. He took Jesus at his word. Now, this sort of faith that, that, that this man had here is actually only captured in the gospel a handful of times. This kind of faith, Jesus celebrated. He praised it. In fact, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet they still believe. This man had not seen a sign yet and yet he still took Jesus at his word and he left. And John writes, while he was still on the way, his servants met him with news that his boy was living. He was alive. He was healed. And when he asked, when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. The faith that this man had exercised without seeing a sign yet now was confirmed by hearing that his son was healed. So Jesus had healed his son at his, at his word alone, but the story doesn't end here. Here's what John adds. The father realized this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So, if I could underline this, he and his household believed. The father here, he first believed in the power and the authority of Jesus, and then he placed his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And this man led his whole household to faith. Now, come on, if you want a Father's Day message, men, here it is. 
Your family will follow your lead, dads. Don't let anybody tell you different. Your family will follow your lead. The Lord recognizes that sometimes you and I, we need to see things to increase our faith. And so he gives us these faith builders. He gives us these signs for the purpose of you and your house placing your faith in him. Don't miss those signs. Don't miss what they're pointing to. Now, I realize again, like we hit a conversation, we hit a miracle, and we're going to hit one more miracle here, and then we're going to wrap it all together before we close here. And I'm way short of two hours, so I got a long time to go, right? (laughs) There, see, it's a dad joke. Thank you. Uh, But let's move on. Chapter five, okay? Chapter five, Jesus meets a crippled man in a city called uh, Bethesda. So let me just read the passage for you, and then we're going to tie this together. This is John chapter five. Starts with with verse two. It said, now there in Jerusalem near the gate, there was a pool. Uh, And here there was a great number of disabled people that used to lie there, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, And one who was there had been there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he asked him this question. Do you want to get well? Sir, the man replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down in front of me. Now, before we we jump into this miracle, I want to point out something. This is different than the first two miracles that John records. The first two miracles that John records, Jesus performed at the request of someone. This one takes place at Jesus' own initiative. Jesus approached the man, and he asked him this. He said, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? This was a question to determine the man's heart because not everybody wants to. Just, Just think about this for a second. Not everybody wants to change. Not everybody wants to get better. It means that you're going to have to leave behind some things. You're going to have to leave behind hurts. You're going to have to leave behind hang-ups. You're going to have to leave behind handouts. Are you willing to walk away from this life that you have settled into? Some people, they want sympathy. Some people want company. Some people want charity. Not everyone wants to change or get better. And so Jesus asks him the question, do you want to get well? And as we see here, the want to is going to precede the how to. Do you want to get better? The man replied with this. He said, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Now, there, there was a tradition there. You could call it a folklore, and that was this. that there were, Angels came down, and they stirred the waters, and the very first person that would get into the water after those, the waters were stirred, they would get healed. And so regardless of where this superstition came from, um, this area, this, this pool was considered by many to be medicinal or healing waters, right? And so this man saw his only hope in someone helping him into this pool, He didn't see hope in the man who was asking him the question. This is really important. He showed no sign of faith that Jesus could heal him. Now, this is sometimes how God works. He comes to us. We don't come to him. He calls out to us. We don't call out to him. He has faith for us when we don't yet have faith in him. And so regardless of this man's lack of faith, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your bed, and walk. The very thing that this man was not able to do for 38 years, Jesus commanded him to do, and with the command came the healing power, and at once the man was cured, he picked up his mat, and he walked. Now listen, for those of you who struggle with the feelings that you don't have enough faith for God to move on your behalf, this story is for you. It calls out the lie of the enemy that you have to somehow earn God's hand. Because this is one of those healing miracles that Jesus performed without any sign of faith on the part of the beneficiary. And there's so much for us to unpack that we'd have to do it at another time. But let me wrap up the story with this statement. 
And at first, this statement, uh, it might be a little bit tough to swallow, but, but I'm convinced as you process this, as you, as you study it, you're going to discover the truth in it. Here's the statement. Your faith cannot force the hand of God. Your lack of faith cannot stop the hand of God. In other words, you're never going to be able to conjure up enough faith to force God to do something that you want him to do. But your lack of faith is never going to prevent God from moving. Now, there's, there, like I said, there's a lot in that. Uh, study it, study it, because we're going to have to move on, okay? I wish I could preach a whole other sermon on that right now, but we're gonna, we need to wrap this up quickly. And we have gone through the book of John. We've continued through it today. Here's what we've seen. Jesus' identity is coming forward as the one who knows, the one who heals, and the one who pursues. We're going to uh, sing a final song together. I'm going to ask our team if they'd come up. We're going to sing a final song together, and as as they do, I I want to tie these together, and we're going to close. We'll come back to this question. Will you allow Jesus to address the real needs in your life, or will you continue to change the conversation? Do you really want to? Do you really want to? Today, is a time for you to have that talk with Jesus, just to be real. Listen, he feels compelled. He has to go through Samaria. He has to go through Colorado Springs. He has to, because that's where you are. And we're gonna wrap up today. As we, um, as we sing this song, I don't want you to get wrapped up in the words or consumed with the screen. But instead, I want you to work really hard to just put your attention and your focus on the God who knows, the God who heals, and the God who pursues. Let's pray. Jesus, you have been so, so good to us. You've been so patient with us when we've acted like nothing is wrong. You've been so persistent with us when we've tried to go unnoticed. You've even pursued us when we really didn't know where to turn. And today, God, we give ourselves fully to you. And we ask for that that living water that you talked about, this gift of your spirit that just flows continually inside of us. And Lord, I ask that you would do the work that needs to be done inside of us so that we can live the life that we really long for pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.